Thank you. Um, it's a great honor and a great pleasure to be here today participating in the Canadian Archives Summit. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Ian Wilson for his time, energy, and expertise, um, not only in sending me 20 million emails a day, but more importantly, making this summit actually um, a possibility. And for that, I'm very grateful. So I'd like to thank Ian. <laughs> I also wanted to acknowledge Dr. Simons. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be in Dr. Simons' presence as well. And I also wanted to acknowledge our virtual audience at now more than 71 locations across Canada, which actually is a bit worrisome because we only do have capacity for 50. So we'll see how the day goes. Um, Ian has acknowledged our colleagues out in BC who've gotten up at four and five this morning to watch the proceedings live. But Greg Walsh, the archivist um, from Newfoundland in Labrador reminded me as well that his colleagues out at St. John's are actually still staying until 7 o'clock this evening on a Friday to also watch the proceedings lives as well. So you're all a great inspiration. <laughs> yes, they'll probably be at a pub. I don't know if we have a live feed to a pub, but there you go. Um, when that's incredibly inspirational and that's commitment to archives, but if you ask the average person about archives, inevitably some sort of stereotype is involved. And usually the words dusty and old come to mind. Um, to many, archives are really old places where old records go to die and to gather dust. Um, to the average Canadian citizen and the average decision maker, archives are very remote from our daily activities um, and concerns of the community. Um, but as Thomas pointed out in his background paper, nothing could be further from the truth. Archives have a tremendous part in our daily lives and our daily activities. Archives form the basis for content for newspapers, magazines, te television shows, films, and websites. Um, archives also clarify family histories and genealogies. They serve as grist for historians, for demographers, and for geographers as well. And more recently, archives are beginning to play an even more important role in medical and scientific research. For example, archives have been used on studies concerning Alzheimer's, um, um, as well as cancers, pandemics, as well as the role of genes in diseases. Archives are now being used in climatology, seismology, as well as studies on our natural environment. And not only that, but archives also have a tremendous um, role to play in accountability and transparency. And I was very excited to see Dr. Kavukian here, the Ontario Access and Privacy Commissioner, because archives play a tremendous role in public accountability and in social justice. And there's numerous examples of archives um, resolving social justice issues, um, such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, and residential schools, issues evolving or surrounding land claims, border disputes, Arctic sovereignty, as well as cases of the wrongly, um, of the wrongly accused, such as Stephen Truscott here in Toronto. And in fact, in 2009, a United Nations report actually stipulated that archivists and archives have a central role in social justice issues and that a strong national archival system is key in democracies to order to, in order to ensure that records that pertain to social justice are actually uh, preserved and saved for posterity purposes. So archives have a tremendous cultural and as well as a tremendous accountability role as well. Now, now in the digital age, digital technologies, um, as Larry Alford pointed out, have made archival records or the possibility of accessing um, archival records incredibly positive and, and stronger. And along with um, digitizing our archival collections, digital technologies have also spawned new areas of research, such as digital humanities, in which researchers use digital and digitized archival records in ways that we would have never thought possible five or 10 years ago. But along with digital technologies um, comes challenges as well. Um, as archivists strive to meet the demands for our researchers to have our archival materials digitized, um, the reality is, is that for, for most archives, um, digitization requires a tremendous amount of support and technological infrastructure as well. 
And for many of us in archives, this isn't actually financially feasible, not only to have a massive digitization project, but also to put in place the search engines and um, web support that are needed to make these records accessible to our researchers. Not only have digital technologies um, made our records more accessible, accessible, but digital-born records tend to pose a problem as well. Um, digital records um, tend to require support from hardware and software, um, technologies that are very quickly obsolete. Digital information is also stored on hardware and software that tends to be fragile and, pr and prone to corruption. And as Corrine Rogers and Luciana um, Durante mentioned in their background um, paper, in order to sure, ensure the long-term access and usability of digital-born records, records creators need to intervene, uh, intervene at, the earlier, at the early stage of records creation, and that there needs to be a digital preservation program in place in order to ensure our digital legacy. Otherwise, if left alone, um, it's fairly unlikely that the records that we create today will be accessible 5, 10, let alone 100 or 200 years from now. Now, archivists have discussed the needs for these various strategies, um, but the issue is, is that um, creators have been very uncommittal about providing resources to archives in order to ensure that digital preservation is in place. In fact, in Canada, very few archives or shall I say, um, not very much digital-born content um, actually currently resides in, in archives. That's because the acquisition and preservation of digital-born material has proven problematic, not only for small institutions, but larger institutions as well. And in the meantime, as we think of digital records, there is a great fear that our digital legacy, um, digital records created by um, government, corporations, and families, might actually no longer be available. So there are many concerns facing the archival community now. Um, the challenges in 2014 are very significant. And in light of this, um, what do we think of a new, or what should be included in our new um, blueprint for our documentary heritage? I would argue that we actually already have the architecture there. And I would say that the Canadian archival system is a very strong foundation um, for our documentary heritage. The Canadian archival system over the last 30 and 40 years have made tremendous accomplishments, whether it be the rules for archival standards and the description, uh, the development of descriptive standards, or whether it be the development of archives advisor programs throughout the provinces to support small archives, just to name a few. And I believe that the Canadian archival community um, is very much aware of contemporary issues facing us. In fact, um, at the time of the elimination of the NADP, the Canadian Council of Archives and the Canadian archival systems were working towards ways to address these various issues. Um, as Lara mentioned, the Canadian archival community was working on um, projects supporting the development of ICA Adam, a descriptive um, database. The CCA was also working on the development of a trusted digital repository um, for archival records as well. So the Canadian archival community is, is very much aware um, and very keen to resolve um, the issues that face us today. I would argue, however, um, that the one issue or the one block, building block that we don't quite have yet, um, and that is a lack of public awareness. Despite the great advances of the Canadian archival system and the significant role that archives play in our culture and in our government, the reality is, is that public support for the public public support for the archival endeavor is still very limited. And I would say this all goes back to that old stereotype of archives as being old and dusty places. I think that um, Canadians and decision makers still don't value archives or understand archives enough to give us the support and the resources we need. I do believe, though, that there's much hope. And throughout the history of the Canadian archival system, we've discovered that when archives engage um, the interest and the imaginations of the general public and of decision makers, good things happen. So I'm hoping right now that we're at that point. Um, I would very much agree, or I would think moving forward, um, 
that we should start looking strategically and building strategic alliances um, with groups and individuals who share our cause and our concerns. Most notably, we should be um, being more strategic and allying and partnering with historians, with librarians, with lawyers, with auditors, and with access and privacy um, commissioners as well. And I very much look forward to um, working with Lara and with Andre towards developing um, some sort of a coalition as we move forward. Now, as Ian was saying, um, this summit is not a one-time only event. Um, and I can tell you that the Association of Canadian Archivists will take whatever recommendations coming out of this summit, and we will be presenting it to us, um, to our members at our annual AGM in June 2014. So again, this is just the beginning of a conversation, certainly um, for the Association of Canadian Archivists. In the meantime, I very much look forward to the discussions today um, and hopefully in the months to come as we work towards a new blueprint um, in protecting and preserving our, our most uh, valuable asset, as Sir Arthur Doughty would say, our documentary heritage. Thank you.